All right, guys, I've just got a nice game to share with you today. I played a bunch of games today. Uh, should have been using my goldfish discipline because two or three of them I literally just hung a piece. One time I captured a rook with my queen and it was defended by a knight, so I lost that. Oh, man. The, this this goldfish stuff, you know, just, just really making sure you read the whole board. It makes a massive difference. It's not just the difference between breaking through 700, 800, 900, 1,000. This is the difference to breaking through 1,500 for me right now. You know, this morning I could have got back over 1,500 rated in, in rapid. And if I hadn't made those errors, I would have done it. It's... Uh, it's bizarre. Anyway, I uh, want to share with you one of the games from this morning. So I'm playing uh, a guy rated 1326 in a regular rapid 30 minute game. And there's a really, really cool puzzle in this that I'm going to share with you. So um, E4, E6, so we've got the French. So D4, grab the center. Makes sense, why not? And we're expecting d5 to come, d5, and now I go for the exchange variation. So e takes d5, e takes d5. Um, now this is meant to have quite a boring reputation, but uh, not, at, not at my level. <laughs> we tend to uh, get some quite spicy games from this. So I bring my knight out, and now black, a bit quiet, plays h6 to prevent my knight from going in to g5. Bishop d3, knight to f6, and now c3. And this is a pattern that I play quite a lot. Uh, also playing as black when I play the French, if I get the French exchange, I'll play my, my C pawn to there as well. With the idea of um, maybe lining up my queen and my bishop against here. Uh, so this way around, I'm, I'm having the same idea. Okay, so, and, and the other thing as well is to bring in this pawn forward, just blocks off the, the path to my king in case this bishop's got any ideas of coming out and attacking my king. So now I bring my... So black plays a6, I bring out my other bishop, and now we have g uh, c5. So I'm not too concerned. Um, I simply drop my bishop back. So here I'm preparing my own ideas of putting my queen now in front of my bishop. Now black captures on d4, and I recapture with my knight. That way it doesn't mess up my pawn structure, and it actually slightly improves my knight, bringing it closer into the board. Now it's just one step away from where the action is likely to be. So bishop comes out to attack the knight. I put my bishop on e5 in order to defend the knight. We have takes and takes. So now I'm quite happy. I've got both my bishops are lined up on adjacent diagonals, looking up towards black's king side. So far, so good. Black castles, and now I bring my queen up to d3. So clearly I'm threatening to come into h7 with checkmate. Um, of course, that's defended right now by this knight, so my job is to remove the knight, and that is the job of this bishop. So I have a strategy. Okay, uh, Black comes across with check, and um, I move my king out of the way. Now, uh, Later on, I thought I should have actually moved my king over this way. But an even better idea might have been actually to castle first, to get my king out of trouble, and to get my rook ready to jump into the action. So maybe it was slightly premature playing the queen to here. So we've got rook rook e8, king moves to f1. Now the knight comes out ready to attack my bishop, but it's too late because my bishop can now do its job and sacrifice itself for to remove the defender of h7. So now black's got two options, can recapture with the queen or with the pawn, recaptures with the queen, obviously, and now I dive in with queen to h7. Now, that would have been checkmate if black had not um, moved the, the rook already to e8. So again, another reason, because I think leaving my king in the middle there was tempting black to play the check and in doing so, created this space, this escape for the king. So the king can now move to f8, and now I bring my knight to d2. Now, one thing that you should be aware of in situations like this is thinking, 
Okay, my queen right now, okay, it's got a, a, a square where, where it can check, but in terms of getting out again and getting to safety, mm, you know, there should be some little bells and lights tingling and tinkling and flashing right now. Okay, so black plays bishop to d7 and I throw in a check. Now I had already kind of calculated what was going to happen. So the king can come to here, I can check again with the rook, and then you'll block with the knight or the bishop. Now, what that means is that my queen would then be under attack by this rook, so my queen is going to have to come back here. Um, so I hadn't really thought it through beyond that point. So the king does move to there. I throw in another check from the rook. And here you can see why it would have been so much better if I'd castle got my king to safety and then this rook could have gone from f8 to e1, sorry, f1 to e1 with check. And my king would have actually been safer. Plus I'd, I could have had both my rooks in the game. Okay, so, and we have blocks. And now the queen has to move back to h7. It's the only square. Now, where can this queen go? Can't go there because it's guarded by the pawn. Can't go there because it's guarded by the bishop. Can't go there because it's guarded by the pawn. Right, so currently my queen's only got one safe square. Have they got any other better colours than that? Green, okay. Well, not green's not very good. Okay, only got one safe square, which is d3 right now. Now black plays knight to e5. And at this point, you see now what this is doing a couple of things, right? One is that it's targeting d3. The other is it's potentially targeting g6. And now there should be big loud bells and sirens going off for white. Uh, and I kind of ignore it. I've played a few games, it's not like my sixth game of the morning and I was, you know, feeling a bit pissed off that I dropped some points and blundered some pieces and lost games that I was winning and stuff like that. So maybe I was feeling a little bit, uh, bit fired up, bit angry, bit gung ho. But I really should have figured out that this, you know, if this rook comes across, where on earth is my queen going to go now? Okay. But so instead of that, I'm thinking more about my own ideas and I'm thinking oh, I want to bring my knight into here because there's a hanging pawn. All right, now, knight to g6 and the door slams shut. Queenie is out of spaces. Um, not good. So, I mean, technically the queen is attacking the knight and also I have a bishop attacking the knight, but they're both defended by a pawn and a queen. So two attackers, two defenders doesn't make sense, right? So let's say bishop takes and pawn takes. Um, the queen's just trapped, trapped in pawns. Nowhere to go. So I bring my knight in now to c5. And um, this is pretty much the puzzle situation, right? How do we save the queen? Rook comes across to h8, attacking the queen. The queen can't go there because it's defended by a pawn, can't go there because it's defended by a pawn, can't take the rook because it's defended by a rook, can't go there. The queen has nowhere to go, okay? This is your puzzle. White to play and save her majesty. Okay, if you want to take a little bit of uh, time, pause the video, please go ahead and pause now. And now I will explain the tactics Okay, so what, what we're looking at is in order to save the queen, I mean, obviously, black is going to capture my queen on the next turn if he can. So, the only way to prevent black from capturing my queen on the next turn is to stop him from being able to do so, right? And what that means is that you need a forcing move. And it has to be a forcing move that has to be more... Um, well, it has to be ultimately forcing. He has, we have to play a move that black must respond to. Okay, uh, in order, taking time, uh, uh, taking away the tempo, the time for him to capture the queen. Right, and there's really only one move on the board that can do that. And the move is rook takes e6. 
Okay, now let's figure this out. There's a couple of tactics here. I mean, okay, so on one level, this is a fork. It's a rook fork. The rook's defended by the knight and it's attacking both the king and the queen. Now, if we have, for example, queen takes rook, knight takes queen, um, then, or queen takes rook, queen takes g7, for example, and my queen has escaped. Yes, it's cost me a rook. Or I could capture the queen and give up my queen. Um, so that maybe wouldn't have been so bad for black. Uh, however, there's another issue as well, is that <clears throat> this pawn here on f7 was doing two jobs. Okay, It's the um, one of the defenders of the knight, the queen's also defending the knight, and likewise the bishop. Okay, Now when I played this move, so we could have had, I mean black could have been fine. Black could have captured the queen and I'd have captured his queen. No, no he can't capture the queen, he's in check. Okay, he's got to get out of check. So what can he do? He can either capture with the pawn or he can capture with the queen. He cannot capture with the knight. With uh, Sorry, with the king, because the knight is guarding that square. Oh, getting all over excited. Okay, it's, it's an interesting position. Okay, so let's say queen takes rook, knight takes queen, rook takes queen, and then king takes knight. So... Um, out of that black would actually have been up a uh, a rook and a knight. We'd both lose our queens, and black would be in a in quite a winning position. Five points up, basically a whole rook up in material. What black decided to do in this instance, so we've not technically saved the queen, but this is interesting because uh, black actually captured with the pawn, thinking. Well, I can save my queen here, right? White's queen is still trapped, but I can, you know, why, why capture with my queen when it could be taken itself, okay? But now look, you have to take into account this bishop here, okay? Remember we said we had two attackers, two defenders, so that doesn't make sense for the exchange, okay? But if pawn, when pawn takes, I can now queen takes knight. And now if the queen recaptures, it's just an exchange of queens, right? So queen does recapture, I get recapture, and we've saved the situation, we've saved the day. Um, I'm actually slightly up, we've both got six pawns on the board, although my pawns are slightly better placed, whereas black's pawns are in three pairs, I've got two threes, okay? Slightly preferable. Um, Black's king is also in the middle of the board, but kind of so is mine, and I've got a rook that's stuck. So materially, in, in most ways, we're fairly evenly balanced. The biggest difference is I've got three pieces on the board against Black's two. Black has two rooks. I've got a rook and a uh, bishop and a knight. Now, generally, the word on the street is that um, exchanging a bishop and a knight for a rook and a pawn doesn't really make sense, although materially, numerically, it's kind of even. But um, it's generally slightly better to have uh, the the knight and the bishop in an endgame than it is to have a rook or a rook and a pawn. And the reason is because it's two pieces. The two pieces can give you far more scope an ability to cover the board and to cause problems for your opponent than than one rook. Okay, so we'll just whiz through the rest of the game because it's uh, it's quite interesting, quite a tactical battle, and there's quite a few more moves to go. Okay, so rook comes across attacking f2. That's not really an issue. So I push b4, defending my knight. Now I did at this point realize that this pawn is actually hanging. But if I'd have taken that and we have then rook to b8, I have to move my knight out of the way and the rook comes down and splits my pawn. So I've, I have, I've won nothing there, right? So I play b4 first with the idea of maybe then capturing the pawn. Rook comes down to attack my bishop, bishop moves back. Rook now comes down here with the idea of a barrage against f2. That's not too hard to defend. I push f3. 
Now there is, you know, I had to work out it, how much of a threat is it that if this pawn comes out, my bishop has to move back to here, the pawn maybe moves again, you know, am I going to get into trouble? And I didn't think I would. Uh, so now black pushes b6, so saving the pawn, retreat the knight, push and hit the bishop, bishop moves. Push, hit the bishop, bishop moves. Push another pawn. And now I simply move my king out of the way of this line of attack from the rooks. So now, you know, rook can't take the, the pawn because pawn just takes, okay? And if push is pawn, pawn takes. Pawn takes, bishop takes, I win a pawn. And the knight is defending this square. So I'm actually okay here. Now rook comes across again to attack another pawn. And now my rook finally enters the game. This is the first thing it's actually done. It's been sitting there sleeping until that point. King starts to centralize. Knight comes back around for reasons that may appear later. I can't see the logic behind that move right now. Uh, rook comes down, a3 as another defender, and now simply king moves into d3 to be the second defender of the c3 pawn. Okay, so now the rook can't capture. It just doesn't make sense. Pushes a pawn, push a pawn, push a pawn. Bishop comes down now with potential ideas of a discovery against the rook. Rook moves away, now attacking this pawn that's undefended, and bishop to e2. So you can see now I've, I've got quite a good level of coordination that, that most of the pieces on the board are actually defended. This pawn's undefended, the knight technically undefended, but it's in a pretty safe place. Um, king's defending that, we've got these defences going on. Okay, but it's a reasonable level of uh, coordination. Now, black pushes a pawn, and I see that I've got a fork on this rook and this pawn, plus the rook can't defend the pawn by going, moving back to f7, because that's covered by my pawn. So that pawn is going to be lost. Black pushes the pawn, and I simply capture. Captures with check, king moves away, rook has to move away, I capture the pawn. Now rook moves here, and we have check, and king to e5. Now I move my rook back to defend the pawn again, and we have a um, king moves over to f6, attacking the knight. Now I simply grab the pawn on e4 with check. Now here you would expect the king simply to move out of the way. My opponent's got almost 20 minutes on the clock. For some reason, he decides to capture on e4 with a rook. And now he's a full piece down. He's a minor piece down. Uh, rook comes across with check. King moves, still defending the bishop. It's not really a problem. And now I just push h3, defending the pawn. At this point, my opponent resigns. Um, but I thought that was a, a very, very interesting puzzle. If we go back to this uh, situation, where the queen seems to be completely trapped and hopeless, I think that... I think I was quite lucky in this situation here because um, even when I played this, black should have figured out that um, queen takes or, uh, well, no, rook takes isn't, a, can't do anything else. Got to get out of check. Queen takes is actually the preferable move. So if you figure this out right now, right now material is equal. I've captured a bishop. So I'm three up, right? If Queen takes, and knight takes, and queen takes. Black is already up in material at this point. It's basically up the exchange, okay? So he's lost a bishop, but he's got a, a rook for it, and we've both given up our queens. And the knight will be on this square and being attacked by king and pawn. Plus, you could argue um, white has a weakness with this trapped rook as well. So I think black would have been in a, a winning position at that point. I don't think black calculated it properly. And how long did black take? 1 minute 21 over this move and decided to capture with the pawn. Maybe what he didn't realize is that that left him in a position with more attackers and defenders against here because of this bishop hiding away down on c2. But this just did not work out well for black. Now I'm actually one pawn up. Black should have been two points up at this point in time 
with a very strong position. So it just goes to show, you know, one, one thing is, <laughs> lesson number one, look after the safety of your demon queen, for starters, okay? Uh, lesson number two, if you find yourself in a, a position that looks hopeless, don't give up hope until you've evaluated all your possible moves. Now, I was like slapping my head at this point and calling myself all kinds of names, but until I realized actually I had a nice check. I had a forcing move. Not only is it a check, it's also attacking the queen, right? So black has to do something about this move. As it happens, he played the wrong move. Um, queen takes would have been absolutely fine. Pawn takes, well, he went on to lose the game. So there you go. Um, the, the, so the final lesson from this, I think, is when you have a critical position like this and everyone, you know, we can all see how absolutely sharp and balanced on a knife edge we are in this position, figure it out. Count on your fingers if you have to, right? Look at the material difference and, and, and think about all directions because, it, yes, it seems like pawn takes is a better move. But with pawn takes, suddenly this knight only has one defender, right? With queen takes, knight takes and then bang, the queen's gone. And the knight's safe. So there you go. I, I thought that was an interesting, interesting lesson to work through. Um, I need to take better care of my valuable pieces and not let them get entombed in the future. Uh, thank you for watching. Please do subscribe to Chess Bootcamp if you haven't subscribed already. Uh, we're, the videos that I make aim to help people to move out of the beginner phase of chess, stop making so many mistakes and blunders, and, and really start to enjoy the game more, get to 1,000 rating points and far beyond. Okay, so thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.